Well, I know that all of y'all really came for the gumbo, not so much for the chalk, so thank y'all for sticking around <laughs> after you've eaten. Uh, just want to uh, get started introducing who I am. My name's Amy Williams. I was Amy Mills, because my mama and my daddy are mad and out to Mills. I don't even see them. Oh, there they are. There you go. Okay, there they are. All right, so yes, that's um, who I belong to, and I'm glad that I have other family here. So we have, first of all, my sister Angela, who lives right up in this area, uh, with her kids, Mary Helen and Brooklyn and Ruthie, and then, of course, my husband Tim and uh, his sisters, they get the prize because they came from California and Arkansas. Wow. So, yes, yeah, just to hear me talk about this, yeah, just, just for this, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, that's uh, my family, and I'm really glad that they're here tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, we live in New Orleans. I'm sure that you will hear all of this because uh, my husband's going to be able to sh preach in the morning. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Mike, for letting him come. But we are from Williams Boulevard Baptist Church in Kenner, Louisiana, which is right near New Orleans, right outside there. I am a student at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. I never in a million years would have thought that I would have gone to seminary, but the Lord opened up that opportunity, and I'm just thrilled, thrilled to be there. So uh, I am studying biblical backgrounds in archaeology and biblical studies. That is the a field that I'm studying at the seminary. And so what's exciting about biblical backgrounds in archaeology is we look at a lot of old stuff, and we get to go and dig in Israel, and it is just very exciting. It all started back in 2017. My husband and I got to go on a dig through the New Orleans Baptist Seminary, and it just started the bug, and I've been able to enroll and then go back this past summer, and that's what we're going to talk about um, tonight. We're going to talk about Tel Hadid. Uh, of course, that's my family, uh, Tim and me. We have Solomon over there who's here. He goes to Louisiana Tech now. Gideon on this side, um, who will be at Louisiana Tech next year. And then Silas at the bottom and JL at the top. There you go. That's who we are. Memo, Papa's little grandkids. So, all right. So, Tel Hadid. So, a tell, if anyone knows about it, I don't know. I didn't know what a tell was. But a tell is basically a hill that has a flat top on top. It's flat on the top and kind of slopes down at the side. So when you're in Israel, when you see a regular hill and you see a flat hill, you know one's a tail that used to be an ancient city and one is just a regular hill. So how do you know it was an ancient city? So, I, so they explain it this way. If you're at the beach and you build a sandcastle and you put a little wall around your sandcastle and you pour dirt in and you pour dirt in and you pour, it fills up the walls and then it starts to slope outside of the walls, right? And then you get that flat top city, and they have those called tells all over Israel, all over ancient excavations or a tell. When you see that, if you read on Fox News about tell something, we were at Tel Hadid, so the name of the city was Hadid. We're doing this excavation through a partnership. It is the New Orleans Baptist Seminary is partnering with Tel Aviv University. And this is a very huge partnership because Tel Aviv University, um, they don't always hold to the biblical account. And so it's wonderful to be able to take a biblical um, view of archaeology with a non-biblical view of archaeology and mesh those two together because we have so much archaeology out there that wants to leave the Bible out. And so we are thrilled to have this partnership it tell Hadid to excavate this city with a biblical focus. All right, so where in the world is Tel Hadid? I know you may not be able to see this very well, but I'm going to walk over here. So um, this is Jerusalem. Well, this is the Dead Sea, right? Dead Sea. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Mediterranean, Dead Sea. Of course, you see the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, but it's not up there. This here is Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem is always level with the top of the Dead Sea. So there's Jerusalem. So if I went up right here, this little yellow spot. Oh, we're going to turn the lights off? Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, that's much better. Okay, so now, y'all, Mediterranean, the Dead Sea, Jordan River. Here's Jerusalem. Here is Tel Hadid. All right? 
So we're very close. This is Tel Aviv. So we are really close to Tel Aviv. So that is our location of Hadid. It is um, actually mentioned in the Bible. You can find the city of Hadid mentioned in Ezra and Nehemiah. Whenever the exiles were coming back from Babylon, it says that they were to uh, build up the cities of Lod and Hadid. So you can find those in Ezra and Nehemiah, the city reference. It's along the Ajalon Valley. If y'all have heard that, lots of things in the Old Testament happened in the Ajalon Valley. So Israel is a growing city. I mean, the whole country is growing. So there, you know how it is with cities. You're always having to put in new roads. I don't know if any of you have done any like tours in Europe and Italy. You know, anytime they dig a hole, they find something old over there in Europe. We don't get to ha have that same pri privilege in the United States because we're not as old. Same in Israel. As soon as they dig a hole, something's going to turn up. So they were trying to build new roads for new you know, all of the city and all of the, the population that's growing. So they have to make it through this area of Hadid. But when they get to the Tel Hadid, they found that the things that turned up were, were fascinating, just amazing finds. So they did not want to plow through the tail. Instead, they put a tunnel. Can you see that tunnel? This is a picture of Israel. This is Tel Hadid. And instead of just plowing through the middle of this Tel Hadid, they said this place is too special. We're actually going to put a tunnel right under it. So today you can drive on Highway 6 right under Tel Hadid. So it's, we're just thrilled because this, this is actually the first major excavation of the hill. So we, are, um, we have the potential to find so many artifacts that can tie and, and tell us more about what happened in this land. But that before they did the dig, they had to do a, an excavate, uh, archaeological survey. So some of you guys may, or women may have done surveys or anything that to do with the land. You have to always have a survey of your land, right, if you ever want to build a house or do anything. So this is their survey of the hill. And so right through the middle of that strip, they did an excavation called a salvage excavation. So they weren't finding everything. They just needed to salvage the land to build the tunnel. So the salvage excavation turned out these type of Iron Age II remains. Iron Age II, we're talking about Joshua. After Joshua, we're talking about the Assyrians coming into the land. I feel like I'm breathing. So... These are some of the finds that we found on the salvage excavation. I want to tell you two things. You may not be able to see, but there's two little clay tablets right there, these two blocks. Those are actually um, Assyrian cuneiform. So cuneiform is when they, when they draw with those little sticks and it's got little lines that go sideways and side. That's what they found from the Assyrians. One of them is a land sale. So someone sold land, and so they wrote up a contract. So these are all contracts. What's great about them is we can find them, and we can read them still. That's very fascinating. So one thing about that one is it's a land sale. The other one is a loan. We know that. We still do loans, don't we? Well, what's very interesting about this loan, this uh, gentleman, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing because you give up your most precious things for a loan, right? They don't just take anything. Is that right? So for collateral, he had given up his wife and his sister <laughs> for collateral for the loan. You'd think he'd at least say sister-in-law. He didn't even say sis. It's just his sister. Yeah, his wife and his sister. I'm going to take it that that was his most valuable treasure, right? That's why he gave up his wife so easily. Yes. So... So that's just a, a really fascinating. And here's some of the, um, the pottery that was um, pulled up from the salvage excavation. And I have some pieces um, from the same time period that I'd love for y'all to look at after the uh, dig as well. But I'm going to go and move and talk about Tel Hadid. So here's the tail from the bottom. You can see all of the trees on there. Those are olive trees. So it was an olive plantation or an olive grove. It actually has olives and cactuses. Who would have thought those things would go together? But what happened was, it is, this is my olive grove, and this is your olive grove, so we're going to plant a line of cactuses in between us, because this is our natural fence. 
I'm like, oh, that's such a great idea, right? Yeah. So you, ha but you know, over the years it wasn't kept, and so now they're just all over the place. But so you have cactuses and olive trees growing wild on the landscape of Tel Hadid. Here's another picture just from up above. So you can see us on top of the hill. Y'all see the little cactus over there? Yeah. So you have the cactus. All of that is olive trees, wild olive trees. And then we're on the top of the uh, Tel Hadid. And you can see way in the distance, there's our Mediterranean Sea, way out there. So what I want to talk about tonight is just the life of a digger. What do you do when you go on these digs? You know, it's so exciting and just thrilling, but what is it really about? You know, it just sounds exciting. So let's get started. The first thing we have to do, up at 5 a.m. on the bus, headed out to the dig site. So we're all piled up in the van, you know, we've got our water because it's hot. So we start at 5 a.m. and we'll work till 1 p.m. Because it gets so hot, you have to stop. You know, kind of like it is around here sometimes, huh? So we start at 5 a.m. And then we have four different sites. Oh, let me, we have four, oh, let me move this back one second. Oops. So this, wait one second. All right, hold on. There we go, there we are. This one. This technology stuff, you know I'm not used to it. All right, so this is Tel Hadid, and I want to show you this because it's a park. Do you see all these little trails through here? Those are all ATV trails, four-wheelers. So it is a national park, so like on the weekend, man, they just go crazy all out there in the park. But one thing that happened is right through here, this little hill, because this is a, a big hill, they wore it down, and they wore it down, and they wore it down, and then all of a sudden, they exposed a wall, an ancient wall. So we're like, oh! We're going to stop. We're going to dig right there. So that's what happened this summer. We were able to dig, and that's where I dug this summer. So here we are on top of the hill where I just show you, so I, uh, showed you on top of the hill. So this is how we do an excavation. We have to first find our shade. You know, every day we have to put up this shade cloth. Every day we have to bring all of our tools up with us because it's a public park. We can't just leave it out there. So we put up every day at the, at the uh, dig site, and we take down every day at the dig site. But that is where the wall was exposed, right there where the orange is. So that, of course, is where we're going to dig. Now, this is underneath the shade cloth. Y'all see it? And so we, you can see down the hill, right, where the ATVs had carved, out the, carved it out. So we had two different squares. That's what it's called when you're digging. This is a square here, one square, and here's the other square. But can you see this right here? So that was the turn of the wall. And that's very exciting when we can find a corner because where does most things fall in our house? We lose them in the corners, right? Corner, it, it all gets pushed up into the corner. So we were very excited to find the corner. And then this is the wall right here. These big stones, it went all the way across, so they would have connected. But this is where those ATVs had, had washed that stone, away, uh, the wall away. All right, so there's one more. Just uh, another picture of that, that ancient wall that was there. Okay, so we know we have to start very early. So once you get to the dig, what is it that you do? Well, you move dirt. You move dirt, and you move dirt, and you move dirt, and you find something, and then you move more dirt. So you have three different kinds of buckets. You have a dirt bucket, you have a pottery bucket, and you have a fines bucket. So pottery is such a simple thing. Why do you know, why do, why is pottery so important? Pottery is so important because everybody had pottery. Everybody had pottery. It was common, and it was cheap. So we can learn so much about it because we have so much of it. We don't have those, you know, tablets that tell us so much information. So we have to look at the different strat stratas of where that pottery came from. And it tells us more about that time period. So you have your pottery buckets. And then, of course, you have your pickaxe and your trowel. So you pick the dirt, then you sweep the dirt, and then you put your dirt in the bucket, and then you have a big dirt pile that you dump it on. And you do that over and over, and your, your little square goes further down and further down, and then pottery pops up out of your square. And it's so exciting. 
so exciting. But once you have all that pottery, then we have to go back to the headquarters. And guess what we have to do? We have to wash the pottery. I thought I was going on this summer trip and I didn't have to do any work and I got away with all my kids and left them with Tim. No, I had to go wash dishes, even over in Israel. <laughs> so you take the pottery out of the ground and then, you know, of course we have four different sites. So we have four different buckets at different layers. So you're, I mean, it's very detailed. You don't want to mess up anything uh, in cross-contaminated. So you get all of your pottery and every bucket has a tag. So you know what piece of pottery came from what site. So you wash your pottery, and then you dry your pottery, and then the pottery reader comes. Who knew there was a such thing as a pottery reader? So you know how some men, they can, you know, oh, this, or some women, I don't know, this car, oh, they can just see a, a car driving down the road, or they can see a piece of a car. Oh, that came from a 59 Chevy. Oh, that came, I mean, you know, they can just name these cars. So there are people who do that with pottery. They can look at a handle, and they're like, oh, that was Middle Bronze Age. They can look at a base and they can say, oh, that was, you know, the Persian period. They know it because they've seen all of these different pieces. So the pottery reader comes and he'll tell us, you know, what he thinks this area that we have found and then we've dug up and where, you know, who are the people? What, I mean, because each people, of course, has a different type of pottery. So were they Philistines? Is it Philistine pottery? Is it, you know, pottery from Europe or Cyprus, Ottoman? You know, it's just, it's fascinating the things that you can find from your pottery reading. So who actually does this kind of stuff? Can anybody go? This is my team that we dug with this summer. Okay, so this guy in the front here, his name is Paul. He is a mechanical engineer from Tennessee. Uh, Mr. Charles in the back, he's actually a banker from Ruston. 70 years old. Uh, I'm right there in the front. Sarah, she's a student at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Mr. Ron Lindo, he's a student at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary also. So it's not just archaeology people who come and do this dig. Anybody can actually come on a dig. If it has been your bucket list to go dig on archaeological dig, you can do it. You are more than, oh look, 70 years old, he did it. He said he wasn't coming back, but he did it. <laughs> so... So it, and we go, um, we're going to go again this year, of course, through the New Orleans Baptist Seminary. I was able to get class credit for this trip. And um, I'm just so thankful that the Lord is blessing this opportunity because I was also given a scholarship for next summer. So I've won a scholarship for all four weeks of next summer, too. So I will be there if you want to come with me. Let's go. The New Orleans Baptist Seminary, they... Um, they take about 30 people, so you can just fill up your um, fill out application, and I'll vouch for you, okay? <laughs> Let's do it. So one of the things that, of course, people want to know is what did you find, and, you know, did you get to keep it, stuff like that. So this is one of the most exciting things that I found. Um, so they have a, if you've read or anything or heard about um, stamped handles in archaeology, Basically, um, you know how it is when you bring your dish to the Tupperware thing, you know, your Tupperware dish to the potluck? You write your name on it because you want that dish to come back home with you, right? A stamped handle is kind of the same way. This is a potter's mark on my handle that I found. It may be hard for you to see, but right here, it's a, it's a double cross on that handle. So some potter marked that handle that says, this is my pot and I want it back, or it's the, it goes to this person, it belongs to this. So that is a, a wonderful thing when we can find potter's marked or stamped handles. We actually have some in the Israeli Museum and other places that say um, Judah on it. So anytime we can, Hezekiah, we have some of those. It'll say oil, it'll say wine, or it'll say maybe what was in that container. Stamped handles are a big thing. So this was my biggest find. I did a happy dance when I found a stamped handle. I was so excited. And you know what else is exciting? Just so that y'all, my little blister on my thumb from digging all week, I was really excited that my blister was in the picture with my stamp. It was like justification of how hard we work for this stuff. Yeah. So it, it, it is just a wonderful opportunity to come and to do the archeology span dig. And I would, again, would love to invite you to be a part of it. But, you know, Israel is such a, a special place because, of course, that's where our Lord actually walked physically 
on it. And so when I have the chance to go, I always say, you know, Lord, I just, I want to be amazed, but I also want to learn something that helps me in my walk with you. What makes me closer to you? And the Lord just gave me something really special on this trip, and I want to share it with you. So I told you that it was an olive grove, you know, the Tel Hadid. The whole uh, hill is full of olives. So this is an olive tree right here. The one thing I didn't know about an olive tree is you have to very meticulously cultivate an olive tree. You know how we have our crepe myrtles and, you know, you have all those little shoots that grow up? An olive tree is the same way. And if you don't, see, I, can you kind of see how it's, it's almost weaved together at the base? You have all those little shoots that you have to cultivate and make them grow together to make it be a productive and fruitful olive tree. What was amazing, though, is there were lots of olive trees that were never pruned. And that, if it's left alone, it won't produce, and it has parasite growing in, you know, parasite uh, plant growing in it. So that is the wild, un trained olive and so putting those side by side you know it was just a, a reminder to me of we all have to be trained by the Lord you know we have to let the Lord move those things out of our lives that we don't need and and point us in the direction to make us fruitful make us productive for his kingdom so I just really thank the Lord that I was able to see that and he showed me that image um, of the growth that we have in our own lives. So thank you so much for just letting me, Dr. Mike, thank, Dr. Mike, Mr. Mike, I don't know. <laughs> thank you so much for letting me come and share about Tel Hadid and the dig. And like I said, we will be going there again next summer. And hopefully because this is a new dig, we expect it to be many, many seasons of excavation there. So you are more than welcome to be a part. So I, um, I was going to allow for some questions, but with the, um, with the reminder that I grew up up the road and I'm not that smart, so make sure it's not a hard question, okay? Is that all right? <laughs> yes, sir? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of times they'll, well, whenever Tim and I were digging in Gezer, we covered it back up, and that's the hardest thing. Oh, my goodness, you dig and you dig and you dig and you have this big dirt pile, at the end of the season, you take that dirt pile and you cover it back up. So at this one, they said they actually kept some of them open and they have fences around them. But like where that uh, and where the hill is, they block that off too. So yeah, they, they do block it off because it's, for Israel, it's their heritage, you know. And you know how it is. Some people don't care, but they really are trying to preserve it. So, yes, sir. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's so neat that you asked this because whenever Tim and I went to Gezer, you know, we were with the seminary, and so you're mostly with Christian and believers who are excited, you know, to be in Israel and to see it. And so everything is just fascinating and proves the Bible, even though we say archaeology never proves the Bible. The Bible stands alone with or without archaeology. But um, so dig at Gezer was amazing. When we're partnering with Tel Aviv University, you're talking about a state Israel school. And these people mostly are not believers. And actually, a lot of the archaeologists, I would say, have a love-hate relationship with the Bible. They really don't want to um, use the Bible in any way for historical reference, historical fact. But whatever city they dig up, oh, it came from the Bible. This is the biblical city of, you know, it's like, well, do you want to believe the Bible or do you not want to believe the Bible? You know, so we actually, um, the Tel Aviv team, um, I would not say that maybe one of them was a believer, and we had, you know, 15. So I believe that's a very exciting opportunity for the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary just to walk alongside two different worldviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I called it the Dead Sea Beach Diet because you did it. It's not just a beach diet. It's the Dead Sea Beach Diet. You work a lot. And you, you know, you sweat it all off. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that, um, those tablets that they were found, those were Assyrian. 
And so all of the names that were listed, they were Assyrian names. They were not Judean names. So they, you know, would, one of the main things that they were looking at is the displacement of people groups. So, you know, whenever um, the Israelites were captured and what happened, they were sent off to exile. So that was very common for the Babylonians and for the Assyrians. They take this people group and they take them off their land because that way they're not going to, you know, try to revolt against us. They're not going to, you know, try to come back together. And so they say that the, um, this Hadid seemed like a Assyrian people group that, that were there and they believe it was a military fort along the, um, the access because, of course, you know where that road is. That's King's Highway connected Egypt to Europe to Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, yes. No, no. So they believe that it was put on after it was fired. You know, y'all know, you know, ceramics is kind of the same idea where before you fire it, you know, you can, yeah, put your name on and all that kind of stuff. But once you've fired it, it's harder to do. And so it looks like it's a hard, yeah, a hard mark rather than the softer before it was fired mark. Isn't that crazy? And they didn't let me keep it. I tried to follow it because, you know, the way we get some of this pottery is that once they read it, they're like, oh, yeah, this, this, we'll take this, trash, trash. If it's in the trash pile, you get to have it. I followed my little potter's mark all the way, but they kept it, so I didn't get to keep it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sure, I can. Okay. I know we're, we're not very uh, close, and you guys can come up here afterwards and take a look at it. So, um, let's see here. Just some different pieces that we have. This actually did not come from Tel Hadid. It came from Tel Gezer, which is right across the Ajalon Valley from Tel Hadid. So, you're talking about same, you know, 20-mile difference. So, um, just different pots. You might have seen on Fox News recently, they had a find of these pots that they had found in the bottom of the ocean. These are amphoras. So, you know, you put oil and wine lots of things in here so this is a handle that i that we dug up out of the trash i don't know that we dug it up i got it out of the trash in gezer but you can see how flat it is right here and how it goes up and if you look at this amphora you can see how this would have been part of that kind of a handle this is what we look for in archaeology we look for handles we look for rims and we look for bases that if because this the, a body shard this is a body shard doesn't really tell us much but a rim or a handle can tell us much because it changes over time right the trends the way they made it the potter what he did change so this one well let me change my slide y'all come up here and look at it I know it's gonna be hard for you to see but this little handle right here if you can see it it goes and it attaches to the neck it attaches to the very top so look at this little here can you see the difference so when we pull it out we're like look it's a jug so that would have been a water jug. That's what's so fascinating, isn't it? I just get so excited. All right, this one, just so that you know what you're looking at when you come and look at it. This would have been a crater, which would have been like this or like this up there on top. You can't really see it. But this is the rim, and this is the handle that would have come off of it. So a lady would have held it like that, you know, her pot. So that's our another little pot. And then, okay, fellas, I didn't leave it out. This is a piece of flint because, of course, they made flint knives, right? And so I think, Tim, Tim, did you find this? I'm sure you dug this up. Yeah, I'm sure you dug this up, Tim. And so you can see where they would have worked the flint edge to make it sharper and sharper. And then, of course, we found some that weren't worked at all. But, but you can see how this one is, yeah. And they used it in the Old Testament for all kinds of things, right? This is an exciting find. I'm going to stop, and y'all can look at it. Let me go back for a second. Okay, this. So this is a base. When you're going to look at this, and you're like, um, that looks like something my grandchild made for me in kindergarten, you know? <laughs> it's not what it is. This is actually, like, see this little cup, kind of a goblet? It has the, the uh, tall cylinder in the side. So... This is the base, and you can see it's starting to come up. This would have been the, that part of the goblet, because it's empty right there. Isn't that fascinating? Okay, so I could go on and on about these little pieces, but I will stop. Uh, this is, 
Uh, so these are all Iron Age 2. Iron Age 2, which is Joshua. After Joshua into the United Kingdom, the monarchy. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them, yeah. So that would have been the settlement period, right? Even So here's a rim right here. See it? My bowl, there's my rim. And then here's the base. See the bottom of it? It even looks like pottery, but people do now. Yeah, there you go. There's your bottom of your bowl. All the, you see why it's in the trash. And these are good pieces to us, right? So they really keep good pieces. So, uh, yes, a complete vessel. Yeah, so a complete vessel is anything, if they have the rim and the base, no matter if it's all broken, it's a complete vessel. So, yeah. So, and then this is, this is a replica. It's not, you know, anything real. It's just a lamp. Um, this would have been an Israelite lamp, a pinch lamp. And I would love to come back and do a Bible study on these, and we can do a craft, and we can make our own, because it's just really exciting, these lamps. But, so that, the lamps and how they change over time. So most of these, you know, any woman could have made those at her house, you know, and used it every day. And then, of course, we move further, further into history, and then they end up looking like this eventually. So I'll have these things up here. You're more than welcome to, um, this would have been an oil lamp. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Uh, so they, this lamp right here, this style, would have been more, Roman into Ottoman period because what's happening is you're getting a mold because once it's like this it's two pieces I have a bottom mold and I have a top mold and once they're made in clay then I'll put them together and I have my little lamp so before I have molds that's when I'm making them like this you know and I still have some like this you know if I can't afford one of these I can make one of those right so yeah so when you're talking about the New Testament and the, well, that was a parable but when you had to have enough oil for your lamps, right? So is that one yeah. one? No, this is a replica I got in a gift shop. <laughs> yeah. It's just an example. Yeah, you'll have a little, the, the wick goes in there. Yeah. Uh huh. And then, so it was a neat um, article that they tried to recreate this and, like, what was the right balance of oil? Was it animal fat? Was it olive oil? You know, what was the wick? Was it wool? Was it, you know, it just papyrus what did they do for th so anyway very fascinating it's just a simple lamp it's just a simple lamp right mm -hmm. but yeah there's so much history in the way it has changed so anyway i don't want to just keep on talking so um i'm gonna turn it back over to you thank y'all so much for listening yes so. <laughs> well, yeah in the morning that's gonna be my husband <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to talk to her and there's things you'll have interest in. And uh, I would really encourage you to go on those digs. I've visited some of the big sites. I've never been on a dig, but I have visited some of the big sites over there. And it's really interesting. I've got uh, one of those little oil lamps that is actually an old one that they found a couple thousand years old. Wow. There's, uh, there's just a lot of neat stuff like that. And so. Uh, let's close in prayer, and we'll just, uh, we're going to look forward to hearing Brother Kim in the morning, and you can visit with her some more tonight. Okay. Father, we thank you that tonight we could, God, just be enamored with that history, and you in our history, God. And God, we know that the, if they dig things up, five things there, Lord, it just validates the word of God. It never just calls it validates. Lord, we don't need that proof, but it sure is, it sure is interesting to see you know, how, how it really staggers the world. And so, Father, we thank you today that you are still revealing truth in our history. And, and God, we just pray you continue to provide and bless, Father, and continue to make these, uh, these things known. Father, the things that are part of that, uh, that, that history of our history, Father. So we thank you for what you are doing and what you will do. God, what you're showing us from day to day in the, in the Holy Land of Father. God, we just uh, thank you for any coming, Lord, and look forward to tomorrow. Lord, and all the things you don't do. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.